involves employment of minority groups in each one of the 17 unions, and it's agreed to and signed by each of the individual unions, on the basis of the percentage of minority groups in the city of Buffalo and the county of Erie, which represents about 10.6 percent. Uh, many of these unions have no minority group representation in their unions today. This will amount at present employment to about 2,500 jobs. However, with the construction programs that are scheduled, now which have been held up, which involve not only State University, but housing in the city of Buffalo, which is essential, this is going to be a constantly increasing number, total number of employees or workers in the building trade in order to meet the need for the amount of construction. So that figure will be going up. Now, Judge Martina, uh, who is a respected member of the community, has agreed to act as arbiter in relation to the implementation of this program. I would just like to say that, in my opinion, we have found here a uniquely constructive solution, and that as a result of the signing of this contract by the unions and the builders in this community, I am now lifting the moratorium and we will proceed with construction. Yes, sir. And I I'm a Baptist here. myself. Yes, and I'm a Methodist. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and, let, and, let me say, and let me say, Governor, that we have, the minority people, have lost faith in you and the state of New York. Now, you did us in on the welfare situation, you did us in in, 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 in busing, and now you've done us in in the construction. Right. And we classify you with the rest of those governors of those southern states that have been keeping us in slavery. And we intend to do something about it. There's a quote in the Bible that says, By their fruits ye shall know them. You're familiar with that. Okay. All right. Now, what we're... Just let me finish. What we're here to do is to cultivate these trees and to be able to pick that fruit, and the test is going to be in the results of the fruit. And this is what you're here for. This is what I'm here for. Reverend, your statement was utterly false utterly misrepresentation of what this state's record of achievement is, and I would just like to say that as a man of the cloth, I just ask you to see for the record what happens under this contract. This season is very appropriate because they have nailed us to the cross of, of minority group negativism and construction nepotism. If we're going to take the form as the criticism instead of the substance, the substance has been achieved. The form was forced into the present form because this was the only way we could achieve it. What, we, what I have said, namely 10.6% employment in each one of these unions, if that is achieved, then you're going to have to You have a conjunction. You have the if. goal was achieved. You have if. You don't, you're not sure of it yourself. All right, Governor. Listen, let, let, let me say this. You said if. This hasn't taken place yet. You're not sure of it yourself. All right, now let me say this. But I'm a long I'm, way I'm going to say the same thing I said to Mr. Meeting. Marshall. The potential gains of this agreement, and it may turn out to be the strongest agreement of its kind in the nation, must not be obscured by the sensibilities of those persons and organizations not included in the final stage of negotiation. For example, None of the officials of the State University of New York at Buffalo were involved in the negotiation. Nevertheless, the extraordinary progress represented by the agreement is clear. The agreement represents an important advance for our region as well as our university. In 1970-71, scheduled construction on the Amherst campus calls for six colleges, two other residential groupings tied to the faculties, important parts of six of the seven faculties and service buildings. The buildings are needed for the expansion of educational opportunities to many more young men and women, black and white, 
and for economic and cultural development to serve all sections of the population of the Niagara frontier. Let's all give it a fair chance. Thank you. It is no accident to note that the president of the New York State AFL-CIO Building and Construction Trades Council, Peter Brennan, has endorsed Governor Rockefeller's campaign that the state building trades unions around the state have endorsed Governor Rockefeller's campaign. And as a result of this rotten political deal, black workers in Buffalo and elsewhere throughout the state are denied jobs that rightfully belong to them on public construction. In short, there is a clear pattern throughout the state of New York, a racist pattern in the building and construction trades industry, a racial stranglehold upon jobs and upon apprenticeship training programs. The union card is the ticket to a job. And if a black man, solely by virtue of his race and color, is denied that union card, he's denied the right to work. There is a state anti-discrimination law, which all practical purposes is dead. If Governor Rockefeller was honest, he would simply close down the New York State Commission for Human Rights. We recognize that there was going to be a new school under the Rockefeller administration university being built. And you know, where they were placing that university at, because there was a controversy there in terms of do it go downtown or do it, where does it go. But we recognize there would be a lot of jobs created out of that, especially the construction work. And we were very rarely involved in any construction, skilled trades kinds of activity. So the minority coalition came into existence with, as a consequence of what was happening in terms of the University of Buffalo and that whole construction project that was taken off at that point. Well, now the coalition was owned by the state. It was a, it was a sellout. Uh, we were negotiating for for real power. We had asked the state to 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 to, to help the community establish a factory that would produce goods. Uh, the governor had assured us that they would identify things that New York State was buying out of state. And whatever was feasible then uh, would be shifted and would be purchased from this factory where we would make them. The premise was that, look, unions, many, many, many poor white people, the only thing they have to, to, to give to their kids, to pass them, is the union card. They're not going to give that up. Black folks should understand you will, you will be able to get into the mafia quicker than you will get into those unions in any appreciable kinds of... We knew that 25 years ago. Today it ought to be damn the parent that we're not going to get into those unions. The minority coalition was saying, let for, let's train, let's identify minorities who can be trained to go into unions. Let's identify them first. And we're saying the hell with identifying people. People need jobs. My first concern is how in the world are you going to get somebody in construction who you never had a construction company of your own and never worked in construction yourself or know the business? Before you can, I always use um, parable and playing cards, the game of bid wits. Most black folks know what bid wits all about. You go to someone's house, the first thing you do, you ask, what are the house rules? How are we going to play the game? If you never played bid whist before, how do you expect to get in the game of bid whist? And this today I'm seeing the same thing. I'm in construction. And I see a lot of folks trying to venture into the field. But you gotta know how the game is played. And this is something that I found a lot of black folks, they thought here's an opportunity with the so called affirmative action and the law states now that we gotta bring blacks in and you found blacks who wanna control blacks who are in construction. That's all it was about. They had the first they had the first inkling of how to go about doing it and getting folks moving in the direct, right direction to the trades. You've got to have the background. Rockefeller was able to buy time 
uh, with uh, this program by canceling out contracts and construction for that particular year. Uh, the state was in the financial bind, and by them canceling out construction and the likes, it gave them a chance to recoup and get more monies into the, uh, the, the state coffers. And so they use us as a tool of saying we got to identify black folks and all to get in construction. And the identification program, it was 300 some thousand dollars, and it was headed by one of our politicians, who he brought some of his friends in, and they set up a program to identify folks. But to me, it was a useless uh, motion because we had a program, the justice program, going in Buffalo at the time, which was uh, set up by A. a Philip Randolph, and it ran nationwide. And it was a recognized program, and black folks had been identified. But it was a case of bringing money in here where others can now get, could reap the benefits or get some money out of the system. And they played the system to a bust. It didn't do anything for getting minorities in. They would go in the corners and ask some of their friends, you want to get a job? And say, yeah, and they come out and register them and bring them in, knowing full well when they went before the white folks to take the test and to, be try, uh, to, be, to enter into a training piece, they weren't qualified. They didn't want the job in the first place. It was just a way of getting some money. And I know from my own experience of being a manpower director for the city, many of the folks who came through these programs, they weren't looking to want, didn't want training. They just wanted to go from one program to another. When they finished up 13 weeks of training, they said, well, uh, there's another, there another program I can go to. I saw so much of that. We had a steering committee meeting, and some black men who were trying to get training through the Minority Coalition came to our meeting and said to us, nobody's doing anything. Uh, we need to get training, we need jobs, etc." And so uh, right there at the, on the spot, uh, a decision was made that we would pursue that. Bill Gator uh, asked Governor Rockefeller at the time down on um, Niagara Street um, at the uh, Mariner Housing complex that was being built at the time, what he planned to do uh, about these men and about the um, uh, minorities in the construction trades. And Rockefeller wanted to lift the moratorium uh, so they could build the uh, uh, UB Amherst campus. And uh, Bill uh, was able to, to get them to to sit down. In fact, the governor came to build headquarters. I think one of the few times, if ever, the governor had really uh, been at a community-based organization in a storefront uh, within the, the black community. Um, and so in that sense, it was a really accomplishment. Um, the other part of that meeting that I recall um, was um, I think Rockefeller's commitment to trying to do something about the building trade industries and their discriminatory policies. Um, it was clear that the unions were not prepared to allow African Americans to enter the trades as journeymen. Uh, and I think that uh, Rockefeller had the wisdom and insight to know that that situation had to change. And um, for a year or so, the state uh, had been uh, attempting to find a vehicle through which they could begin to implement an affirmative action program. BUILD, fortunately, I think had the um, resources, the community backing, and the um, staff uh, to put together a program that was um, acceptable to the state and to the community. And so out of that meeting came really a funding package of, I believe, about a million dollars to set up uh, a um, skills assessment center and to begin to uh, try and integrate the building trade union. Towards the end of 1970, the process of establishing the BAAP had hit a snag when it came down to convening a special task force, which would serve as the decision-making body in the program allowing representatives from the minority communities to work in conjunction with the unions and contractors. BUILD had already conveyed the need for immediate action in minority hiring and training at a five-hour meeting with members of the University Construction Fund Council, 
where they had also discussed other programs related to integrating the construction trades. Not only had the task force not yet met, but there had not been any official meetings of the committees who were to detail the plans for integrating individual craft unions either. Build had warned the state to act soon on this program or else they would withdraw. The Build organization and other parties in the affirmative action program, which are the unions and contractors, have just about run its course in patience. The other main party, which is the state represented by Governor Rockefeller, has been dragging its feet as far as convening the task force. We feel that it is impossible, illogical, backwards, and short-sighted to talk about an affirmative action program when the governing bodies have not yet met to lay down the guidelines and rules for this program. I am reporting to the community at large today that as far as we are concerned, there is no affirmative action program. There never was and there never will be until the task force meets. Not long after Richard Ford made that press statement, Governor Nelson Rockefeller appointed Robert Douglas as the chairman of the BAAP after a discussion with the program's mediator, Judge Joseph Matina. One week later, the task force met. We authorized or agreed to authorize a new program for BUILD to begin to engage the technical manpower to draft proposals to be submitted to the state for state assistance in meeting problems other than that of employment, specifically in the area of recruiting and placement and training, establishing a training program for basic educational skills, housing, daycare, narcotics, and some of the other problems that are a particular concern to the minority community in the Buffalo area. How can you convince the minority coalition the Buffalo plan will work? Well, I would be hopeful that uh, through the good offices of Judge Matina and through the hard work that the BUILD organization has already put into this plan, that what we've done today and what we plan to do over the next month will be acceptable to the entire community. We also spoke to the University Construction Fund head, Dr. Anthony Adenolfi. How does the pace of the Buffalo plan relate to the pace of building at uh, the university? Well, it'll permit us, of course, to move ahead more smoothly. The, uh, the uh, Amher building of the Amherst campus has significant impact on providing uh, on-the-job training opportunities, as does uh, any increase in the volume of construction in Buffalo and Erie County. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. What funds are available, and when really do you think we'll get started? Or well, we've had uh, great success in getting started at the Amherst campus as of the end of this month. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the end of January. We will have either awarded or have on the market for construction contractors to bid some $85 million worth of construction there. And I suspect that many of your listeners have been out around. You can see that we've uh, cut up that property pretty well. After today's meeting, there's no question but what Albany is going ahead full speed on the Buffalo plan. The question is, will Buffalo follow suit? Well, the outreach and recruitment program uh, that, that Bill headed up uh, uh, the, the recruiters would go out to pool rooms, bars, street corners, wherever, wherever uh, minority men congregated and recruit the individuals uh, for the various trades. Um, uh, the trades that, that they recruited for were the operating engineers, the asbestos workers, the sheet metal workers, the plumber, the electrical worker, and the glaciers, and the painters. Um, all you had to do was be mechanically inclined and over the apprenticeable age, which I believe was about 21. I might be, I might be mistaken. Uh, it might be 19, 20, 21 in, in that particular age category, and be um, uh, again mechanically inclined and have a desire uh, to want to participate in 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 that particular craft that that you were were, were most suited for. These individuals were recruited, then they were sent on to build assessment center where they were assessed, their skills were assessed.
The activities inside this former church here on Northland Avenue are helping a lot of people to learn where it's at for themselves in the ever more competitive job market of today. This is the Skills Assessment Center operated by Build of Buffalo and funded by the State Labor Department. The center applies realistic skills assessment procedures to obtain an accurate appraisal of an individual's work skills, worker traits, and training readiness. It is a process using performance tests related to true work situations to analyze and study each person's basic skills and work traits. Well, everybody has some potential for work. It's a matter of finding out what it is. Many people that uh, we evaluate, if they had gone to a plant, they would never have been given a chance on a job. Mm -hmm. Well, we have some actual samples of work out of industry right here, and it's all right for them to try out on these. So they keep uh, exploring until they find something that they're very good at. Mm -hmm. And if they like this, then we make a referral to the uh, industry or to any other employer or a training situation if training is needed. What has the evaluation program here at the center done for you? It's done a whole lot for me. It has um, brought to my attention the things that uh, I'm not too good at, mm -hmm. you know, and the things and the places where I'm most strong at, mm -hmm. you know. And um, with working with the different objects and um, the different tests to find out just where my weakness is, mm -hmm. you know, this is what, you know, I've gained from it. Skills assessment is a test of reality, not theory. It analyzes direct work performance and helps the individual to find his capabilities, enabling him to redirect his efforts to attain his full potential. First, the, uh, uh, the applicant was interviewed. Determination was made based upon the interview. Then there was an orientation session. The orientation session uh, com was composed of enlightening the uh, enrollee about work conditions, how to get a job, how to maintain a job. Uh, we tried to address some of the needs of the particular enrollee, such as uh, well, in some cases we would provide a stipend. And many of these individuals were, uh, had received or were receiving public assistance. The, we had uh, our, there was the counseling section that we had. We had an evaluation unit. And then we had one member of the New York State Employment Service who eventually would uh, try to provide employment for individuals coming into our program. Uh, one of the uh, particular features of the program was the evaluation unit where we had work samples. Work samples, we, we felt that reading and writing things were causing problems for some of our people. We're freezing them out of jobs. We said, some of our people who can barely read and write can do some of the jobs that they now have no chance at. Why don't we then use samples of work, time them, check them against industry standards, and see if the, our, our the people we would evaluate could do those jobs. It turned out that this was a godsend. Uh, we, they were able, even able to deal with work, uh, paper and pencil test better. They would wash their hands and uh, go take the paper and pencil test, go back to do another test. It was simply one of the things that they went through. Therefore, it was not as frightening as the only criteria that would let them in or prevent them from getting a job. What it did is it showed you who you were and what you were and what abilities that you had and it helps you put a kind of a, a label on certain things that you didn't know. In other words, you might be interested uh, in a specific field or a specific career area or a specific job. And when you go in for the interview, the best that you can say is I'm, I'm interested and I'm a hard worker. And we hear that a lot today. But what we were trying to do at Skills Assessment Center was saying this is what I have to offer to an employer. These are the skills that I have. These are the things that he needs in order to operate his business. And that was very important. And Skills Assessment Center would take that kind of a process. Uh, it would take uh, your dreams and your aspirations and kind of put them in concrete terms for you to say that this is a career path that you can follow, uh, not just the job. And that's where uh, a lot of people go wrong. They look for just a job instead of a career. And one of the things that we were trying to do is to show you how to market yourself. 
Uh, instead of us going out, I, they have an old adage that says, uh, if you give a person a fish, you feed them for one day, you teach them how to fish, you feed them for the rest of their lives. That's what we were trying to do, is show them how to take care of themselves. You know, if someone would say, I'd like to work at Westinghouse, we had a commutator. It's almost like a, a um, light demo. And, and, and its effect is it will give more or less power to a motor to make it go fast. And um, we, we brought in samples from Westinghouse, te tested those people on time. Can you take this down? Can you put it to, can you assemble this? If these are being manufactured at Westinghouse, can you assemble this in the time that people who are currently doing their job uh, perform this? Postal clerk, clerk had, had to sort letters and throw them. We could find, we could test the person on how many letters they could throw in, in, a, in a specific period of time how accurate, but what the level of accuracy was. That's the sort of thing you do. You know, as I run into some of them, even as late as today, they say, they say, John, we thank you guys for the Bill Skill Deception Center because I learned from there that I had the ability to do a number of different things. And as I run into some, as I was saying, some of them today have doctor's degrees, master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, working in all kinds of different types of jobs, where at that time they did not feel that they had the opportunity to move in that direction. And many of them were high school dropouts. And the Skills Assessment Center, what it did, it encouraged them to go back and get their education. It was a mentoring kind of thing also, because it was a big family affair. People came, they got service, they found out some good things about themselves, and they provided assistance to grow and develop in terms of employment opportunities. Working is something that you do for 20, 30, 35 years of your life. It's a long process. And what we were trying to do is find some balance for you. If you're doing something that you enjoy, you're doing something that you're qualified to do, you're doing something that is going to bring you the kind of reward that you're looking for, you're able to take care of your family, you're able to, to buy a home and, and buy the car that you're looking at. Those kinds of things are important in terms of your day-to-day -day operation, your day-to-day -day ability to live. And that's what we were trying to do at Skills Assessment Center, is give you the framework for you to go out and have a future. At this point, I would like to share some additional information on Build Academy that was not touched on before. First of all, the policy board consisted of representatives from the Buffalo Board of Education, Buffalo State University College, and the BUILD organization. Each had a specific function. The Board of Education handled legal, administrative, and budget matters and made sure that they were implemented within state law and regulations. Buffalo State University College assisted the Board of Education with grant applications and provided consultant services for experimental programs and research projects. They also provided on-site undergraduate college courses for auxiliary personnel. And the BUILD organization involved the parents in classroom activities and organizing committees within the academy. Early on, we decided that we need to expand the policy board. The first policy board was made up of 15 members, five from the college, five from the Board of Education, and five selected by Bill. And what we discovered is that uh, when we got to some very hard decisions, uh, the college didn't really want to uh, uh, take a chance and, and vote one way or another. So it was always Bill and the Board of Education that was resolving these things. And so I think was that uh, why should the board or the college have equal representation of Bill. This was our school. So we, uh, we changed the makeup to 18 members and we gave uh, uh, the board three, uh, the college three, and Bill had 12. Well, I always said as much as we said we were a community controlled school, we never were, because in order to be a community-controlled school, one has to have fiscal autonomy. That means you have your own funding, you decide how your money is going to be spent completely and totally. 
we never had that kind of rain to do the kinds of things that we perhaps thought we wanted to do. But in terms of being funded by the school system and allowed greater autonomy than most schools in the district, we were able to do some of the things that we felt were important for kids. And that was important for BUILD because we were going to be trying lots of things that had never been tried before. So in terms of that, we came closest to community control than any other school has. Thank you very much. Yesterday, I think at exactly this time, Tom Soto on my right and I and about eight others walked into D Block a Vatican prison. We faced some 1,500 prisoners, most of whom's arms were locked together. These were the so-called rebels of D Block. I brought with me to read to you what these men wanted, what their cry was to a government that murdered them today. They said this, we are men, we are not beasts, and do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. The entire prison populace has set forth to change forever the ruthless brutalization and disregard for the lives of the prisoners here. What has happened here is but the sound before the fury of those who are oppressed. What demands that will bring closer to reality the demise of these prison institutions that serve no useful purpose to the people of America, but to those who would enslave and exploit the people of America. They sat in that prison yesterday and they said nobody would be harmed, not a hair of the hostages head would be touched. All they wanted to do was negotiate. They said if the police came in, they would kill the hostages. They made this quite clear, and in making it clear, they told the authorities, keep negotiating. We want to negotiate. Tom and I were led in yesterday yeah. by Brother Richard Clark. We were led up to microphones. We spoke. We saw seven hostages. We heard the men in jail. This was our third or fourth visit since this stop in there. If you forget, they have died in vain. If you forget, let's keep we are it lost. down. We're going on. Let's keep it down. Don't let the man hassle you. He wants to break this up. Attica caused a worsening of treatment of prisoners all over the state, not just in Attica? I think it's very obvious with the reluctance of the state to allow the press to come in and members of the New York State Legislature that the uh, repressive conditions have heightened tremendously. In all prisons? In, in all prisons. And that the inmates have said to me, Mr. Eve, we did not kill any hostages. Uh, we tried to resolve this thing peacefully. Uh, and people must be aware that we are not going to be dehumanized. We're not going to be subjected into a kind of condition mentally or physically that will take away our manhood and our, you know, decency. of a demonstration in Marine Midland Bank and when we got the news of the Attica uh, rebellion and so we took a busload of people out there just to see what was going on and when we got out there uh, Assemblyman Eve was already there and so uh, 
Some of the inmates uh, had heard about Bill and what we were doing in the community, and they requested that uh, we be added to the observer list. A whole group of people were coming from all over the state and to be observers uh, and also like negotiators uh, to try to resolve that issue. We started out as observers and ended up being negotiators. So I became part of that representative bill organization along with uh, one of my staff person, Domingo Rodriguez. It got to the point that uh, the state decided that they were not going to negotiate with the inmates anymore. And so they kind of like told all of us to go home. And of course, as you know, the next morning they came in and retook uh, the prison and killed some 40 people or so. Commissioner Oswald said the decision to bring the Attica uprising to an end was made in order to, as he put it, to preserve the penal system. I'm wondering what your feelings are about this statement and what other alternatives you feel should have been made. Well, I think that that statement is probably one of the most ridiculous I've ever heard. We brought uh, Captain Calley to trial, you know, for the same kind of thing, saying that he had to murder people in order to preserve something. There's no excuse at all, you know, within our system for murder, a uh, particular kind of murder and mayhem that was uh, wrought at Attica. Well, actually, uh, Bill went in to, to, uh, to try and mediate. Uh, we began to try and establish uh, some um, affirmative action within the guard population in Attica that had been all white and rural white. Uh, most of the prisoners, as you know, are, there is today, are, were urban blacks. Um, there was always this sort of conflict and this racism that existed. And Bill uh, attempted to set up some programs to begin to integrate the guard force uh, in Attica, as well as to uh, monitor the um, the process in addressing the grievances that the inmates had brought to light uh, during the uprising. They're designed to implement a federal grant which will pay for the immediate hiring and training of minority members for prison guard jobs. The initial goal is 50 with almost all earmarked for Attica. Dr. Alan Bush is coordinating the project for the state civil service department. Doctor, is this type of minority recruitment an about face for civil service and the corrections department? They have constantly recruited them, except I don't think the emphasis was on it as much as it is now, for many reasons, as we're all aware. And it, in order to do so, we realize you've got to go right into the community and do it. Minority groups angered at what happened at Attica feel this type of recruitment is a must in order to avoid future confrontations. history and culture, uh, books about the whole black struggle for liberation, uh, both in, in terms of its historical context and its present movement, books in Spanish about Spanish culture and Spanish history, uh, the struggle of Spanish and other minorities in this country. So we're basically thinking about a readable library rather than uh, an academic kind of library. This was one of the uh, demands from the uh, inmates during the uh Attica riot. Uh, you apparently aren't waiting for the state to do anything on this. No, we aren't. We, um, 
we realize uh, from the reports of our people who have been out there uh, that the library facilities are inadequate, uh, particularly most library facilities are inadequate when it comes to black culture. Uh, the state um, is dragging its feet in doing anything about the demands of the uh, inmates. We feel that uh, Buffalo could show its uh, support, its solidarity with the inmates in their struggle uh, by providing this kind of facility. Are there any restrictions that you know of as far as the type of books that will be allowed in the prison? Not that we know of, and if there are any, uh, that will be part of the continuing struggle that we'll have in seeing that uh, those inmates have the right to read uh, the same kind of books that any citizen reads. From your contact with the uh, prison itself, uh, what's changed since the riot, if anything? Well, the report that I have uh, from our people who've been there, not very much. I think our efforts there, uh, particularly, I think, led by the... Um, primary director or the staff person uh, in Bill at that year, Bill Gator, uh, I think were really um, outstanding. And I think they took on a um, um, yeoman's job, really, in terms of addressing that issue.